Emanuel College and the Emanuel Business Collaborative, I'd like to thank you for being here for our panel discussion on ESG. We look forward to an afternoon of interesting commentary that looks at ESG from a variety of stakeholder perspectives. Our goal this afternoon is to better understand how environmental sustainability, social equity, and responsible corporate governance matters to businesses, investors, and the public sector in Boston. So we're very lucky to have a great deal of support for this event. Uh, first, I would like to thank our event sponsor, Amalgamated Bank, for helping to initiate this important discussion. Uh, Amalgamated Bank is the largest certified B Corp bank in the country. Amalgamated partners with organizations that advance positive social change, including not-for-profits, foundations, labor unions, political organizations, and for-profit social impact enterprises. Amalgamated Bank has been a leader on climate change and worked aggressively to move the banking industry towards alignment with the Paris Climate Agreement. Their mission is simple, to help those who do good do better. In addition to Amalgamated Bank, the Emanuel Business Collaborative has been lucky to have the long-term support of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber is an independent, nonprofit organization that is the convener, voice, and advocate of our region's business community. Through its networking and advocacy work, the Chamber helps its members and Greater Boston succeed by connecting business leaders in order to make, build meaningful professional relationships, inform the business community on important issues facing the region, shape public policies that sustain Greater Boston's competitiveness, and provide leadership development programs that foster professional growth. So that brings me to the Emanuel Business Collaborative. So we launched the Emanuel Business Collaborative in early 2020, great timing, right? Um, as a way to foster a higher level of experiential learning for our School of Business students, many of whom are here today. By fostering new forms of experiential learning, we found that our students could both learn from and give back to this local business community. The sense of giving back uh, and fostering social justice is a foundational element of Emanuel's mission. Therefore, we work to develop future organizational leaders with a commitment to social justice by engaging local businesses who share this commitment. Um, we have uh, one of our local business partners in the audience today, uh, Diane Austin, and I think her sister Pamela is a, is a Shattuck is here virtually, uh, from Coils to Locks. So Coils to Locks was our business partner this semester. Um, uh, uh, Diane and Pamela founded their company um, as a resource for African American women who are experiencing medically related hair loss um, due to cancer and other uh, medical issues. And they wanted to find wigs or hair prosthetics that allowed these women to maintain their natural kinky coily style. So it was both filling a market need and also addressing uh, racial disparity in the healthcare market. So incidentally, Diane and Pamela have also spent the last two evenings with many of you and many of our students. Um, so we really appreciate uh, their support of the collaborative as well. Um, so now on to our amazing panel. Um, so first, we have uh, Cynthia Dallagelis, Senior Vice President and Director of ESG Investing at Amalg Amalgamated Bank. Uh, since 2005, Cynthia has worked with leading technology firms, brands, and private corporations to conceptualize, develop, and grow socially and environmentally responsible conscious businesses. In her current role, Cynthia's focus is on bridging the relationship between her network of global family offices, leading foundations, and, e and institutions with ESG investment possibilities. In doing this, she works to develop thematic-based investing strategies that focus on gender and social justice as well as climate change. Next up, we have Betty Francisco. Um, Betty is the CEO of Boston Impact Initiative, a social impact investment fund that intentionally invests to close the racial wealth gap in eastern Massachusetts. Uh, she is the co-founder of Ampli Amplify uh, Latinx, a social venture that is building Latinx economic and political power by significantly, significantly increasing Latino civic engagement, economic opportunity, and leadership representation in Massachusetts. But he is also co-founder of the Investors of Color Network, a consortium of black, black and Latinx accredited investors working to close the racial funding gap and startup capital. We also have Shagun Adoa, who is Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion for the City of Boston. Um, in January of 2022, Shagun joined the Wu administration as, the chief, um, as their Chief uh, of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. And in this position, Shagun is focused on making Boston a resilient, economically equitable, and vibrant city that centers on, pe centers on people and creates opportunities to build generational wealth for all communities. Prior to joining the Wu administration, she could have served as the president and CEO of BECMA, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts. BECMA is the chief advocacy organization for black businesses across the Commonwealth. BECMA represents over 2,000 black firms that employ 17,000 mass residents and generate over $2 billion um, in annual revenue. 
And last but not least, we have Tom Brown, who's the Director of Economic Inclusion from the, Boston, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. Tom leads the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce's economic inclusion team, focusing, uh, focused on engaging the business community in efforts to create an inclusive and wealth-generating economy for all. This includes managing the Chamber's pace-setting equity initiative, which convenes large and mid-sized companies and anchor institutions committed uh, to using their purchasing power to intentionally increase spend with minority business enterprises. Okay, so enough from me. I'm going to turn things over to John Barrett, a co-founder co of the uh, Manual Business Collaborative and lecturer of economics and management at Emanuel. So John will lead the panel through a series of questions, and then at approximately 5.30, we'll open up the floor to some audience questions. Those of you who are listening in on Zoom can feel free to type questions into the chat, um, and our colleague, our colleague Jing Yang will bring them to the panel. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so let's dive right in. We've got a, a lot of questions here and a lot of ground to cover, so... Um, let's get at it. So uh, we're going to start off with a pointed question to each of the panelists so that they can um, sort of shine a light on their specific area of, of expertise. Uh, we'll start off with Cynthia. Um, um, so Amalgamated Bank has a set of these uh, responsi funds. Um, two of them, are, or two or three of them, I believe, are uh, publicly traded stocks or equities. And so my question would be, how do you go about picking those stocks? Uh, is there a methodology that lets you know which companies are really Kind of on the forefront of ESG, is there any sort of, uh, or is it, or is it more subjective, um, you know, by choice of the portfolio? Yeah, I know that's such a great question, and obviously, top of mind is ESG has become such a mainstream conversation now, right? It's no longer this like niche thing that only a few people were focused on. It's really kind of common lingo now that everyone's using to define greater transparency within corporations. Um, so when we decided to create a set of investment products that were focused around social justice, racial equality, gender balance, and climate, we really looked at like who are the best in class data providers for those particular issue areas. Um, we have an internal ESG board that convenes and kind of does a stock by stock analysis, but we really rely heavily on independent data providers to give us best in class information. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a single data provider yet for all of this information, and there's not a centralized system to do that. So we really rely on a filtration process where we go through six or seven different um, data providers to kind of end up with best-in-class um, holdings for any particular product set. Um, all of that to say, none of this is forever. We continually do a quarterly check-in to make sure that those products still kind of meet the mark that we were looking to hit when we design them. Um, and you know, as this space evolves, and I think as data matures and there's more available information, we'll continue to become um, more pure, if you if you can, um, in the way that they're constructed. But it's an ongoing it's an ongoing process. Yeah, I believe it. It's a, it's a new phenomenon. Yeah. So people are trying to play catch up a little bit, aren't they? Amalgamated is doing these um, these funds of publicly traded companies on sort of a macro scale, and the Boston Impact Initiative is doing something similar sim similar, but on a very micro scale. And so you're looking to to invest in local companies either through debt or equity, um, and so you know instead of the the usual triple bottom line for ESG, people, planet, and profit. You've tweaked it to economic justice, community resilience, and enterprise health. Can you explain a little bit um, what these mean and how they feed into decisions around which local companies to invest in? And, and by the way, we've worked with a couple of your companies in your portfolio, uh, Hillside Harvest and, and Vision Production. So oh, great. We're on the right track, I think, at EVC. Oh, you are fantastic. Well, you've been a great partner to us as well, so thank you. Um, and thanks for having me here today and for convening this great conversation. Because uh, I think it's, it's uh, we don't talk enough about ESG to really understand what does it mean. We all have different terminologies and uh, ways to evaluate it. Um, so just a quick plug about what is Boston Impact Initiative. We're an impact investment fund. We're a nonprofit uh, impact investment fund. Seven million dollar fund started in 2017, and the goal is to invest integrated capital. That means for us, equity, debt, and grants. And it's all the tools in the toolbox. So when we say debt, it's everything from term loans, lines of credit, loyalty finance, receivables finance, equity is all the convertibles, preferred stock, demand dividends, and grants, right? Also using 0% um, return uh, capital as well, philanthropic capital to help support businesses owned by people of color or businesses that create jobs in communities of color. We're a place-based fund, so we focus on Eastern Massachusetts. So trying to support both for-profit and non-profit enterprises. 
So the way we look at ESG, and I'm going to ask for some, a slide to go up the plus, that's great. So we, this is pretty new. Uh, our founder, Deborah Fries, came up with this way of visualizing how we think about both impact and return. So traditional investors or conventional investors are often just looking at the financial piece, right? So what is my financial return and what's my risk, right? So the more risk you take, the greater financial return you typically want. The ESG part, which is the impact, is often not looked. And what we're advocating for is, let's start to look at these as integrated measures, right? Where you're looking both at financial return and risk, but you're also looking at environmental, social governance, as also risk factors, of, but not in the context of, you know, uh, is the company not doing enough of these, but what is the risk of not getting the impact you want, right? So, if, for example, Today, take a fossil fuel investment, you might be looking to invest in, I don't know, maybe some here might look at that, because you might generate a really hefty return given the war in Ukraine, right? And you might say, okay, the risk, the, the, the financial impact is really high, the risk is high as well, but what is the ESG risk, right? The ESG risk that you continue to perpetuate or that investment perpetuates ongoing climate change, um, or that the workers that, work, that are working in that particular um, company, right, they're not paid well, maybe they're taking on added um, safety risks. So th there's risk in that investment that you're not meeting those metrics. So the way Boston Impact thinks of it, if we'll go to the next slide, is we're flipping it um, and saying we want to look at investments from an integrated standpoint. So we want to look at both the financial risk but also these three other measures, which for us, um, the E, the environmental, is community and climate resilience. So within community, we're, both, we're looking both at what is the impact of place, who are all the players that this particular enterprise interacts with? Is it supporting local suppliers? What's its supply chain look like? What are its other stakeholders? We look at the environmental impact, obviously. Is it um, create, mitigating its carbon and water footprint? Is it um, managing waste? Um, where is it using renewable energy if possible? And then we're looking at relationships to what relationships does it have to place with its workers and its suppliers. Enterprise health for us is the G, so that is partly looking at what's the financial health of the organization, what's the leadership structure, that's where we look at board, who governs it, who manages it, is it diversified, is it, do, do workers have a say? And then um, on the economic justice piece, um, for us that's one of the most important pieces because we're trying to close the racial wealth divide with our investments, so that's looking at who owns and controls the business. Right? We want to shift ownership and control and power to communities of color, communities that have for a long time been underinvested in, and, and through our investments we can try to shift who owns. So we look at you know who are the owners, is it um, in, immigrant communities, people of color, women, and then we look at opportunity, how are workers paid, right? Um, are they paid livable wages? What are the benefits that um, that enter enterprise is providing? So we're looking across all of these measures and integrating the risk and return so that in so the that end, end, these enterprises are driving actually positive social change. So it's not looking at ESG from a risk perspective only, which is often what public companies are doing, but rather saying, can these enterprises move the needle around systemic change? So it's a, it, it's a funky new framework, but I hope that it, people start to adopt it, even in their public securities investments. Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> so let's move to the public sector in Michigan. Um, so uh, as of late, investors, um, including the public sector and, and pension funds, um, are divesting from unethical companies. Um, currently in the news, people <coughs> running away from Russian companies or being invested in Russian companies and divesting of that. Uh, from those companies. Um, so this is positive, but you know, does the city of Boston, beyond just divesting from unethical companies, does the city of Boston um, have a, a proactive ESG investing um, strategy in it currently, and if, if not, did they have one in the pipeline? Well, first of all, how is everyone doing? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it goes, it's just important to me that people watching on Zoom know that they, we have a full theater uh, and that there are folks here who are interested in this conversation. And that's why I clapped earlier, because it's like there was no movement going on. <laughs> um, and 
uh, clearly I chose the wrong place to sit. We were all debating about where we should sit, and uh, I did not come as prepared as Betty, but that's <laughs> standard. We have been working okay. together for a long time. I've, I've got to go last. That's yeah. well, that's true. That's true. Um, so first of all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank um, Emmanuel College for this opportunity. Um, I want to thank uh, all the folks that, you know, in my previous role, I was already working with Emmanuel College uh, on some initiatives, and so to be able to continue that work in this new role is really exciting. Um, and important to me, um, and also want to thank Amalgamated Bank, uh, where again in my previous role was able to work with the president and, and team there. Um, and I'm very uh, excited of the fact that the bank is a leader uh, on this conversation for a really long time. Um, so great to be here, and then of course my two friends on this panel, uh, Tom from the Chamber, which was a great partner, and then Betty and I are sidekicks. So, um, so I. Uh, I'm going to be a politician for two seconds, given that I work in the public sector, um, and filibuster for one second, just to say a little bit about why uh, the title that you heard uh, uh, mentioned uh, related to me. So uh, my cabinet used to be called Office of Economic Development, and now it's way longer, uh, called the Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion. And if you were to take the acronym, uh, it's uh, the Office of EIEIO. <laughs> so clearly we're bad at acronyms. I should have thought about that before we came up with the name. Um, but one of the reasons we changed the name of the cabinet from economic development to opportunity and inclusion is because when a lot of Bostonians hear the term economic development, think of that term economic development, they don't see themselves in the term economic development. What they see are the cranes, they see the skyscrapers, they see or think about the conversations about gentrification, displacement, um, and so it was important to myself and the mayor before I made the transition to, the, uh, to work for the administration uh, that before people meet me, before they meet uh, members of my team, that they understand exactly what it is we're doing and who we're doing it for. And that's why uh, the mission or vision that was shared earlier, uh, one of a city that uh, is more equitable, more sustainable, more vibrant, one that centers its people, one that creates more opportunities to build generational wealth across all of our communities uh, is, uh, is important to us in, in ensuring that uh, the folks in the city who help make it what it is, um, that they understand that everything we're doing is undergirded uh, by this uh, focus on equity. So uh, to your question, uh, which will be a shorter answer uh, given how I just filibustered in the beginning. Um, you know, the short answer is yes, there is a strategy and, you know, um, the mayor we have right now in her foresight, and I'm, I'm not saying this is a show for the administration, but someone who has admired her uh, leadership and courage on a lot of issues that are important to me in my community for a long time. You know, uh, when she was a city councilor uh, back in 2014, uh, had a whole hearing about the city even exploring this issue and the role of the public sector uh, in uh, ESG. And then in 2019, uh, as a president of the council, led the effort to ensure that the administration was already beginning to divest some of its money. So through an ordinance and working with uh, community partners like the Boston Ujima Project, ensured that the city at that time in, in 2019 divested $150 million from fossil fuels, uh, tobacco, private prisons, um, and began the conversation about, well, now that we're taking money out, where do we put that money? Um, and then uh, one of her first official acts uh, as mayor of the city of Austin in December 2021 was to sign an order that she and the team put together uh, further divesting uh, Boston, uh, City of Boston dollars from these industries uh, and making sure that we are divesting all of our dollars by 2025 uh, from these harmful industries. And so in talking with the CFO before I walked in here, because I wanted to make sure that I was accurate in what I said, especially since there may be media, um, so I, I don't want them to say the Wood administration is doing, you know, um, something that isn't actually true. Um, there, they have already been working on that strategy of where we put those dollars and have actively been investing those dollars in actually what Betty just uh, read out. I was sitting here like, oh, yeah, we got to get your meeting with the mayor because literally those are the types of industries and companies and things that we want to make sure as a city we are investing in. These are public dollars and they are, they are supposed to be used for the public good. Great, thanks. Tom, we finally got you. Um, so is, the Chamber has launched um, many initiatives over the years that advance equity and aim to create a more uh, inclusive business community. One of the Chamber's initiatives called Pay Centers works to close the racial wealth gap by encouraging large companies and anchor institutions to diversify their supply chains. Some of our large neighbors here in the, in the Longwood area are part of your Pay Centers program, which is, which is great to see. 
Um, how does pay centers work, and what was the commitment from the companies that signed on um, for the chamber's additional actions, such as the public call to diversify boards and infuse governance with diversity? What type of meaningful steps are you seeing the business community take? Thank you. Um, so pace setters, ultimately, it's a, an initiative of the chamber, which is trying to do what the chamber does best, which is bring businesses together for a greater good. Um, and so what we're doing, and you know, the Red Sox, uh, Boston Children's Hospital, some of those you know, most recognizable names in greater Boston and beyond, you know, we're trying to bring them together and have them increase their spend with minority business enterprises or businesses of color. Um, and for the reasons that we've heard earlier, you know, those investments into those businesses, into those owners of color, we would see trickle down into the communities from where they operate and where they're born from. So on a practical level, we do that by you know, convening, um, having the procurement officers who are actually gonna buy and spend the dollars of those companies for a service or for a product, look at the MBEs. You know, when previous years, they might have only gone to the same supplier time and time again. Now we want this network to encourage each other to work together to actually identify different MBEs who can provide that service. And what we see now is actually a really innovative offering coming from these new entrepreneurs. So you know, that's a big part of what we're doing for that goal of you know, having the community from where they're born um, you know, uh, uh, thrive. Um, so really what we're asking these corporations to do is commit at the top level. You know, we want CEO buy into this. Um, we ask them to share their data. So what is the percentage of spend going to those MBEs? Um, and then to really be an advocate, you know, if they do a deal, you know, tell us about it. Let us use our fantastic, you know, following, you know, to, to spread that message. Uh, and we've had some, you know, fantastic stories, you know, Hillside Harvest getting a deal with the Red Sox. You know, that might just encourage another vendor to say, you know what, yeah, I'm going to create this thing that I've dreamt of and, and get it out there in the world. So, so that's the goal. And more broadly, to answer your second question, um, yeah, we're really trying to encourage you know, this, this long-term commitment to diversity. You know, we know things can be fashionable. Um, it's our job as a chamber to keep kind of elevating you know, the, the, the good stories and the commitment that we're seeing. So not just because it's the right thing I do, but, but you know, we are interested in businesses thriving. And actually that competitive edge is what you can get by diversifying you know, your staff, your suppliers and everything else within that ecosystem. Great, yeah, Hillside Harvest, the official hot sauce of the Red Sox. Um, okay, so let's open the questions up to everybody on the panel. So you just jump in uh, whenever, you, whenever you like. Um, so, you know, many definitions of social issues morph and change over time to be uh, more or less inclusive around issues that appear in society. Currently, there's discussion about whether ESG, in addition to environmental, social, and governance issues, should also include lobbying and political support uh, as part of it, um, looking at what uh, companies uh, do with their lobbying dollars and what uh, political action committees they support. Should there be more transparency around how a company spends its lobbying dollars or what PAC it supports? Should these corporate activities be part of ESG evaluation? Spicy, you might have different answers on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go first? We're all scared. <laughs> well, look, I mean, you can't on the one hand say, yeah, we're a pro worker, we want to pay them great wages, we have great benefits, and we are recruiting, you know, uh, and using all these great tools, and then through your lobbying efforts, you're um, trying to drive down the minimum wage. You're not supporting, you know, uh, paid leave or um, you know, paid sick time for your workers. Like you can't have it both ways. So I, I think that there should be disclosures and as employees of these corporations, we should be asking, hey, by the way, where do we lobby? Where does our PAC money go? What candidates are we supporting? Because you will see that there is absolute conflict between what's said and what's actually done from a regulatory perspective. And as we know, a lot of the, the, the work that we all do here is trying to drive systemic change to address issues of inequality. But if you have, on, on the one hand, regulation that keeps perpetuating it, it it's counterproductive, right, to what these corporations are saying. So I know we, 
in the end, you, we have to ask and we have to become politically active. So that's my stance, but I'm an activist. So. Mm -hmm. no, I'll, I'll chime in that in, I have a lot of conversations over the last decade trying to bring people up to speed with what ESG means and that like finish line keeps moving. So I always tell people like one fun exercise is replace ESG with the word transparency. And if you have full transparency into a company's doings, where they're spending money, how much they're paying people, what their policies are across the spectrum, then you can make decisions on what do you think about that company and do you want to be involved? Is that someone you want to advocate for or support? And then that's kind of ESG kind of evolves out of that, right? Then you can base your decision making process and investing your dollars in the things that you care about. But just replacing that with transparency gives people the ability to be able to make an important decision. And for sure, for me and, and our perspective from a, from a financial institution, you know, lobbying is definitely a big part of that and political affiliation is a part of that transparency. I mean, if you, for those of you who don't follow the news in this space, you know, last month the SEC passed a land, well, proposed a landmark um, initiative around transparency in climate disclosures for all publicly traded companies. And this is a huge deal because if something like this is able to pass, that gives us complete transparency into, you know, um, greenhouse gas emissions for all publicly traded companies. And so if the information is out there, then people in the public and investors can make decisions around things that uh, fit for them. But transparency is key. So in your, in your experience, is this kind of double talking common companies like this? Um, oh, sure, answer is yes. You don't yes. have to answer the whole question. Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. I don't know if I suspect it, right? Anything to make sure they're making it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that's unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> So ESG is not necessarily a new topic, but it, it seems to have gained momentum and gained greater attention from corporations in uh, recent years. How much did recent social movements help to accelerate the recognition of ESG initiatives by corporations? So, yeah, I can um, jump in on this one. Uh, I don't want to take off my city hat, as you can see the invisible hat, and put on my former hat uh, where it was. I mean, the events of the last couple of years have absolutely transformed everything, uh, you know, whether it's the pandemic, well, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the pandemic of uh, uh, systemic racism that we are now confronting uh, seriously in this country in 50, 60 years, um, absolutely is transformed. And it's, you know, not just the thinking of folks uh, in, in the corporate side, but even on the consumer side. I mean, people are uh, voting with their feet and their dollars and making sure that whoever uh, they're doing business with, it matches their values uh, and their principles. So, you know, have, what, what I will say that I am encouraged by is that two years later, we're still having this conversation and folks are still moving in this direction. I think about, um, so every panelist I'm on, I wind up quoting my grandfather who told me not to confuse motion for progress. And, uh, you know, when I think about uh, his words to me, I think about, you know, this 50 years ago, we were saying, in fact, this past uh, April 4th, uh, two days ago, today's Wednesday, is that right? Yeah, the, you know, the day ends in Y. Um, but, you know, two days ago, April 4th, we were acknowledging um, the 54th, I believe, uh, anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And so that uh, a particular moment in history, we were having this conversation um, about where folks are putting their dollars, what their value, value rate, all those things. And then in, in the 70s, things start to shift, crack an epidemic, and then, you know, here we are 50 years later having this conversation. But what I'm encouraged by is that we're still having the conversation and that uh, there's actually a bigger thrust, I feel like, even in 2022, for folks to move toward, um, you know, making these investments. Because at this point, it's not even just about doing something to feel good. It's like, this is actually the, the soul of, of our world. Like, this is the future of this world. And so, um, anyway, it's for sure, though, uh, the, the, uh, the revolution we've seen happen before us in the last couple of years. And, and if I could just add to that, I think, you know, companies particularly want to be on the right side of history. You referenced, you know, Russia earlier. And we've seen that, you know, the last two, three years and, and <laughs> even further, of course. Um, but I think, yeah, consumers are, are using their, their dollars. Um, we see a big rise in ERGs, employee resource groups, having more weight, you know, more senior representation on those groups, mm -hmm. more of a route into senior management um, to actually seek change from within you know the staffing body um, and you know 
you can't escape it now, right? You know, we we are ready to call out these companies who don't do right, you know, by their consumers, by their staff. You know, you go on Wikipedia, there is that controversy drop down. You know, that's gonna be there forever. You know, so I think companies have woken up to the fact that again it's not just the right thing to do. If you want to stay competitive, you need to get this kind of stuff right. Yeah, people are paying attention. Um, so, Shigun mentioned the pandemic. Has that affected um, any issues around maybe uh, you know, labor and, and, and workers' pay? Um, has that accelerated in that area? Um, and it's changed, I think, the way that corporations see their employees as part of their system. Um, and we've seen some concerning switches, which are, you know, if we're all working from home now, we're not maybe traveling into the city, you know, do we need to be paid as much? You know, but then what does that do for someone's budgeting, projections, childcare, etc.? So I think it's definitely changed what the employer, you know, considers is needed, but then also the employee. And of course, with the great resignation now, um, people haven't had time to consider their career trajectories. Um, you know, it's, it's had a huge impact, and that's what we observe across businesses. But I'd be interested to see what the other. In the businesses that we work with across the board, right, they all are experiencing labor shortages, very challenging environment to recruit from, um, and as a tool, they've had to raise compensation, enhance benefits, create more flexible environments. They're talking about how do we improve our workplace culture even, right, because it's not enough to have great compensation and benefits, but the place you work in has to feel like it's a place of belonging and inclusion and um, our millennial and Gen Z um, folks are demanding that as as part of where they want to work. So that's all you, right? Um, and and so it is. Tra I actually think it is transforming um, how we think about um, those tools, right, to attract amazing talent. Um, and and wages are rising. I think by seven percent or so. So I, I think the pandemic did accelerate that. I think Black Lives Matter really put this in the spotlight is that a younger generation, investors, consumers now expect corporations to have a point of view on social issues and environmental issues. And before that was never a factor. Like I never looked to Coke for like moral and like what does Coke think about this? Or what like it didn't even occur to me that or anyone that, that was a thing. And now we look to corporations and brands and cities and countries to have a point of view on all of these different factors that we didn't look to them before for. So I think a lot of these like incorporating um, the factors that we do we have women on board, do we have people of color represented in this company, we can't go back now. Like now we all are like talking about it and it's all out there. We can't like undo that we all know that this is an issue, that these are shortcomings that we have as a global society. We can't turn back. So I think the lid is like completely off and I think that's a good thing. I don't think we'll ever go back to a point where like the conversation continues to happen. I think this is now table stakes. Going forward, I don't think this is a trend or a wave. I think this is the new normal, and we build from here. Well, <clears throat> great. Whether you knew it or not, you segued right perfectly into my question. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to pull a quote out, and it's from Felix Baudreau. I apologize to him if I didn't get his last name right. He's a managing partner in sustainable market strategies and ESG research firm in Montreal, and he says ESG was firmly put on the decision-making table in 2020 after being a strategy that was nice to have. <clears throat> it now, it's now a performance issue that senior executives must address whether they believe in it or not. So my question is, to what degree does this quote reflect reality? Is ESG becoming ingrained in corporate culture or is it likely to ebb and flow as in its importance and reflection of society's sentiments? I think we answered it a little bit. I mean, yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, certainly the you know this is a this is day ninety four for me. Uh, not that anyone's counting. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly the the companies you've had at the table, this has been a forefront of their minds. So I'll give that'll be my short answer for this whole panel. And I think where it's going to ebb and flow is on what are the issues of the day. Obviously, the pandemic, the racial like the three pandemics, right? The racial reckoning pushed the S and the G, right? The, they they really accelerated those. But we also, I think there was a recent report about like, if we don't address climate change in the next seven years, we, we will be on a course that is irreversible. So I think the more um, 
you know, media attention, the more research, the more focus there is on particular issues, it'll ebb and flow. But I think they're all here to stay. And I think the more educated we all become around why these are so important, um, we're in a position to advocate for them, whether it's as an investor, whether it's as a consumer, whether um, you know it's for our own children. Like my kids tell me every day, you've ruined my planet for me. That makes me feel awful, right? Like, what do I do? I, like, I, I'm sorry, you know what to do. I think that's where I become so much more focused on climate and what do we do there? Because that, that, that one's not moving as fast as it needs to be. Agree with the quote, and I'll say he's about like 40 years too late to think that 2020 is when it like took place, <laughs> but yes. To your point on climate, I think there's many mechanisms that we're using us as a financial institution, individual consumers, to try to be as net zero aligned as we possibly can, right? As a bank, we're committed to 2045, and we're doing different um, things to get there without um, uh, substitutes. Um, that's an important thing to us. I think that a lot of the proxy voting and activism work that we're doing within the funds that we have in order to gain control or influence in particular products is helpful. Um, I think an amazing organization, if you guys are unfamiliar with Engine Number no. One, is an incredible uh, hedge fund, a, a ESG oriented hedge fund that did something remarkable this year by getting board seats on Exxon Mobil um, by their advocacy work. So there's definitely a lot of levers that are being um, pulled specifically on climate and, and social justice, but there's a lot of different ways to approach and we all have um, different tools that are at our access and even just the representation on this board, we're all kind of attacking the same problems, but from a different mm -hmm. um, perspective and different mechanisms that we have to, to, to use. So let me just ask you, you mentioned the board there, does, does Amalgamated in their response funds, do they make any, I mean, they're, they're, they're just a fund manager, so they're not, you know, shareholders, but do you, do you encourage that kind of um, sort of technique to, to, to pack the boards where you can on companies to, to affect change that way? And, yeah. and if you do, do you find that say, that actually works? Uh, for sure. So that particular product set is a little bit of a different strategy. That particular product set, we're looking to highlight best in class within ESG um, opportunities across gender metrics. So specifically, let's say we have a gender fund. In that fund, highlights the top 100 companies globally that have uh, the best gender um, equality metrics within their organization. So equal pay across the gender spectrum is something that's really important. Paid parental leave for all genders. Um, access to health care, um, parental leave, sorry to mention parental leave, parental leave, um, health care, um, all of those kind of important factors. We do have a separate product set that's something that we've had for decades that we use for advocacy work, and we have a lot of um, actions that are, are done with those particular tools. But yeah, our um, cheapest sustainability <coughs> item for sure is someone who heads all of that, and we have a long rich history of doing a lot of advocacy work for workers' rights where we feel like the needle can be moved. It's, it's definitely a tool that we use and one that's very, very effective. Great, great. Um, so, it, so as ESG becomes uh, more of an integral part of corporation strategy, will Will investing with an ESG thesis become obsolete, or will the ESG investing market focus on incremental or marginal differences in ESG initiatives across corporations to seek that value difference? I think we could probably both touch on sure. it. Uh, like I'll add, I think for me, what I see ESG evolving to from an investor perspective is an extended set of data points that you're taking in from a due diligence perspective. Yeah. All of that basically means when I'm looking at analyzing a company from an investor perspective or a city perspective, when I'm saying, does this fund make sense for us or does this company make sense for us, financial outcomes is just one data point of maybe 300 that I'm looking at. And all of those, similar to the presentation that you just gave, are weighted in different uh, capacities. And I think what has changed now that we will go back from is the financial outcomes won't consistently outweigh any sort of social or environmental factors or whatever the data facts end up being. I think we're looking at a different scale or we're looking at does one outweigh the other. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think you'll start to see some nuances. So some investors, like investors in our fund, we are not a fund that is going to make you rich, right? So we are an impact fund. Our returns are, are limited and capped. And, and there are investors, right, that um, are specifically looking, not for the financial return, but for the impact. And they're looking beyond even the way we talk about these. They, they literally are looking for racial justice. 
Like they want to see systemic outcomes. And so you, you're going to start to see more of that. And um, you know, it's interesting because registered investment advisors that work with, say, wealthy individuals or family offices, they have, um, and the, the, the investors are saying, this is what we're looking for, this is what we want. And so the advisors are scanning the market for funds that are focused on any of these. But it's almost like these are passe, right? It's like you've got to keep pushing on the social justice, the racial justice, systemic change. How do we build a, you know, a new world, a world rooted in solidarity and neutrality where it's not about financial return anymore, but it's about creating a new world order that, um, you know, has opportunity uh, and, and uh, you know, and wealth building and ownership for all. So that's what I see, like it keeps evolving and there are more and more people that just want to invest in that way and they've actually disinvested from any public securities because they don't believe that that moves the needle anymore. Do you think the big funds will adopt this view though? That will, will they not put a priority on return? Um, you know, the big kind of pension funds and, and, and you know, public funds and uh, funds by Morningstar and the rest of them that, that want to deliver returns. Do you think they'll come around to this view or do you think there'll always be that section of the investing world that, that kind of prioritizes the return over anything? So it, it, it will depend on who's the investor, right? So when you think of big pension funds that are uh, they're trying to return to, say, a retirement plan, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, the, yes, I think to some extent they're going to prioritize financial return. But when you start to think of, if you have community investors, right, people in your own community, unaccredited, low-income folks that are starting to invest themselves, that's when you you start to see like a shift a bit, you know, as far as um, only financial return. Because in in those communities, you want to see these other factors move even more, and by virtue of them moving, right. So if you have um, disinvested communities that are not building wealth, they own their home, they, there's increased home ownership, there's great paying jobs, right? There's wealth building in another way, way. right? It's, it's not not investing alone, right? right? So, so I, I, I think there are pension funds, there's certainly uh, endowments, there's, I sit on two foundation boards where the endowment is being invested differently, right? We're starting to shift just from pure financial return to also investing in funds led by people of color, managed by people of color, um, but that have a social impact component as well. I'll say a, a nice surprising thing that's happened over the last year, specifically with the Malcolmated, is we get calls, like a lot of our historical clients are from the union and tap part of space of saying, hey, like we've revised our investment policy statement that now includes these new factors, these new environmental factors and these new social factors. Can you help us transition, right? We still need to make a quality financial return because we have an obligation to this network and to this group, but how can we do as least harm as possible and make a positive impact and still get a substantial return for investors? I think when you're looking at the spectrum from an investment perspective, there can be like high impact where there's like impact bonds and we're, we're measuring unit by unit for impact and there's no uh, assumption of any sort of financial outcome to the complete opposite side where it's like purely capitalistic and I don't care what happens to the community and the environment. And like the goal is to kind of get everyone somewhere in the middle where they're like getting a responsible return in relation to environments and communities that, that are like pure philanthropic dollars because there, that's a whole other mechanism that you can use. But as far as these larger organizations, I think most of them are, are transitioning over slowly. Even, you know, I don't want to belabor this point, but I'm thinking of insurance companies, like they, sure. they're looking out in the future and they have to meet, you know, okay. they have no choice. They have to meet a certain return to meet their obligations in right. the future. How are they going to be able to, because most of the time ESG is a lower return, right? So, so how are they going to be able to balance that obligation to their policyholders, their you know, life insurance folks, mm -hmm. and, and do their, their bid on ESG? Well, the first thing I'll do is push back on the fact okay. that ESGs <laughs> have low returns, because that's not totally accurate, um, but there's a spectrum of, of available returns within ESG. Again, you're incorporating additional data points mm -hmm. into financial outcomes. So again, weighting that depends on that individual investor. So if I want a financial outcome, but I also want to see these uh, social or environmental outcomes, and I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of that financial outcome to kind of boost some of these up, that's up to the individual investor. 
we have products for sure, both on the public side and I've worked on the private side as well, that have uh, market-like returns, like dollar for dollar of the S&P or the Russell 1000 that are excluding fossil fuels, weapons, private prisons, all of these things that you maybe don't want to invest in and are highlighting best-in-class uh, opportunities as far as companies and the returns are spot on. Um, so you don't necessarily have to sacrifice, right? That's a narrative that I for sure am like, trying to try not to be consistent basis. Um, sorry, I lost your other point. Oh, so insurance companies are a great, a great example. I think something that's top of mind in consideration for us, and I know a lot of larger organizations, is climate risk. Climate risk is now something that's being factored into portfolios that are centered around insurance, um, weather insurance, um, homeowner insurance in different areas, um, development of private equity portfolios that hold real estate assets. Like climate risk is now a substantial factor that's in those portfolios that maybe wasn't there 10 or 15 years ago. Okay. Yeah, I stand corrected, or partially No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll argue later. I'm, 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 not, I'm not offended in the least. I'm not offended in the least. Um, okay, so let's put on our dream hats for a sec. And let's try to imagine um, not what's happening today, but let's try to imagine a future perfect ESG world. Uh, if you had a wish list of initiatives you would like to see under ESG banner, what would they be? And how can the public and private sector work together to facilitate these changes? And how can they work together to improve what is currently being done? Well, I have to make a list. Because I, I got my own checklist too. I mean, you know, ownership is a huge piece, as Benny mentioned earlier. Um, you know, uh, the people of Austin don't own their land. We need to. Uh, you know, be focused on that. Um, certain things around supply diversity, uh, uh, with the makeup of, of leadership, you know, all those things are important. But like I said, it's all about um, making sure that we're focused on systemic solutions as opposed to uh, this evolving, which, you know, quite frankly, Boston has a history of and, and companies here as well. Um, have one of the reasons we are where we are is because we have gotten away with being comfortable with this symbolic. Um, and taking credit for it, believing that that is the change that we need. And the reason why we've seen a whole uh, world, a whole country erupt, is because the masses of people who were ignored and, and looked over um, and got tired of it and are assuring that their voices are heard and that they're at the table. Anyway, I can go for your whole speech on this, but the point is systemic uh, change as opposed to symbolic. Yes. Yeah, so you heard he's. So, yeah, I mean, my dream is that we can create a more in a sustainable, um, inclusive economy, local economies, but that we tackle this massive wealth gap in racial inequality that you know, we continue to exacerbate with all the practices that you hear, you know, you've heard of it today, companies trying to counteract those, but they are getting worse. Um, and so, I, you know, I do have a dream that we start to move the needle. It may not be in my lifetime, um, but that my children have a different outcome and their children have a different outcome. And you know, we in my equalizer we have this sort of measure, which is the, the social and the governance combined, but it's what we call new majority power. And you know, we haven't talked about demographics, but as you've heard from the 2020 census, we have the beginnings of a massive shift in our demographics in this country, where people of color, immigrants, are going to be the new majority. And with that comes a responsibility to ensure that there's equal ability to participate, equal ability to own, equal ability to have say and decisions. Um, and so, and we don't have that now. We don't have enough representation. We don't have enough economic power so or political power so that's the stuff the activist stuff that i work on on how do we build a political and economic power for people of color and women so that they can have a say and a voice in shaping the future so that is my mm -hmm. and so I, I could go on to you but i think my answer is a little bit more romantic in the sense that um what I hope comes out of this movement is a sense of uh, individual ownership, that everyone feels like they can make a difference with the tools that they have available to them. So not everyone has an opportunity to work at a bank or work for the city or is able to you know, be incredibly intelligent and put financial models together because that's hard. I didn't like that. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> someone does. Yes, 
There's all of these things that can make um, real change feel unobtainable to, to, to different people for different reasons, right? Maybe you didn't have the opportunity to go to university, maybe you didn't have the opportunity uh, for education or the right job, and I think that it can feel really disheartening, like what can one individual person do? And I think what we've seen in the past few years is that one individual that feels really powerful about something has the ability to collectively um, use bargaining mechanisms, whether it's like social change or environmental change, that one person can start a tidal wave. And I hope that coming out of this, people feel like regardless of your, your circumstances or backgrounds or demographics, you have the ability to use every tool available to you. Great. Um, I just have a quick, quick, quick thought fly in my head. Um, how, how much has social media and the internet kind of propelled this ESG? I mean, if I'm thinking back 10 years or so, um, the, the social movements that we had in the last couple of years, I don't think they would be possible without that kind of platform and infrastructure on the internet set up where people quickly exchange information and, and film and pictures of what's going on. Um, for people that have been in this longer than, than I have, has that, have you said it shown up on your radar that's really kind of a propeller of this? Um, Yes. Yeah. As a member of Black Twitter, I can say <laughs> <laughs> that yes, um, social media for sure, uh, as the as the representative of the voice of, of the people. Yeah. I mean, even when you look at you know, there's there's an initiative called it used to be 2020 women on boards, and now I think it's 2030 women on boards so to get 20 percent of women on corporate boards. And the way they disseminated a lot of information was through social media, right? And it's, and it's outing companies mm -hmm. with a lot of diversity. And you see it with the you know, proxy initiatives, um, state, what is it, investor, investor activism, all of that is going on social media now. And because it goes viral, yeah. it, it, it educates and it creates momentum, right, for the effort. I mean, you get a lot of backlash too, but I think it has, some, it, it has made it possible to disseminate this this wide for sure. And I, I guess I've just added that so much of all these moments about after the fact. So something controversial happens and now that's everywhere and there's a backlash. I think what social media does is create a fear if I can be sad with it. And a good fear because it's actually making sure that things are being set in place to avoid, you know, these challenges or these problems coming about. And that can only be a good thing. So it's not Big Brother watching anymore, it's a lot of little people watching. <laughs> right. Um, so let's open it up to the audience um, and see if they have any questions. Uh, thanks for being here. It's very nice to hear you all talk. Um, so I was wondering if any of you, I know that you mentioned it earlier, if you've read the um, enhancement for, of standardization of climate-related disclosures put out by the ICC, and if you have, what are your thoughts on how this could impact your individual industries and your day-to-day -day, like work operations, like your everyday lives? Yeah, so have you read it? <laughs> Great meeting material on Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a, there's implications across the board. And from a professional perspective, if these organizations are now disclosing all of these factors that were transparent before, I think to what I was kind of noting earlier is that there's a reckoning of truth uh, from an investor perspective, endowments, foundations, um, unions, they have to make a decision now knowing what they didn't know before. I think it's kind of like behind the curtain. We all know that publicly what those data points are, but we don't really have them as far as like a material um, outcome or report. Um, and what we're pushing for, what they're pushing for is to have that. And, uh, and it's a game changer. And I think this is the first of hopefully many initiatives that require greater transparency from large organizations, publicly traded companies, around gender pay policy, around other governance uh, structures. So again, greater transparency is, is beneficial. Um, from a personal perspective, I think it's exciting. I, I will be excited for all the calls that I get of people panicking, wanting to move their money into to different things, which is a good thing. Um, as far as individual um, effects, I don't know. I'm trying to think of, you know, I don't know. I think what we're seeing even now with the, with the current conflict, the, the effect of gas prices, it's so geopolitical oriented that if the more transparency there is around climate disclosures for these large companies, does that move individual dollars away from certain companies? Does it move people away from 
you know, more towards electric cars or more towards, you know, not using certain delivery services as much. I think all of those things will probably feel, but at the end of the day, it comes down to like the individual choice um, that we all have uh, collectively of, um, you know, is this an organization that you want to support uh, by buying something of theirs or using their service? Um, and I think large corporations are already on the edge of reckoning with knowing that this is coming um, and trying to scramble as quickly as possible to, to kind of get on the right side of history like you were, like you were noting. We can chat about that later too. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll, I'll, first of all, who's your first name again? Micah. Micah? Great, good to meet you, Micah. Well, I have not yet read the report. Uh, but some you said, well, you know, but anybody had this error got canceled, so I certainly know what I need to do now. Um, but you know, transparency is always a good thing. And uh, what a report like, or not the report, but the effects of that report, what it will have on the work that I'm doing is making sure that you know whoever we're partnering with as a city, whoever we're sitting down with and building programs or initiatives, etc., um, that. It, it helps us be more selective of who we're working with, right? Because the stamp of the city provides, um, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, currency, right, that that, um, that others can use to their benefit, right? And so it, it helps us make sure that we are partnering with folks who share the same vision, not just publicly, but in, in uh, what they're doing, and you know, with their practices and their uh, uh, investments as well. So I would say that's the impact on us. And then again, you know, share with, share with what Cynthia said or share with her personally, it's a great thing. You know, me as a consumer, et cetera. So, but how long is it? And can I just say something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a little fun for, for the students here is that this is going to create jobs, mm -hmm. right? Because people have to learn how to evaluate, measure, disclose these new criteria. Um, so I don't know if it's Compliance folks, lawyers, right? But it, it, even on the accounting side, there aren't enough people that understand this that well, and it's going to create an, a whole other industry sector where talent is going to be needed. So it's just I, I plug, give you a plug for that because maybe um, it could be a new career path for you. I'll say I never felt popular in my life until the past like 24 months, like in my entire life, but now I know what it feels like because everyone is talking about this topic and everyone wants to know your opinion. So there's definitely a huge amount of opportunities in this uh, space across the spectrum. So you're going to love to find the clip notes. Yeah, we'll, we'll share. Yeah, well, share. I'll, I'll take her copy of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight, taking it all in. My name is Marlis, and as an accounting major, my question has to do with ESG reporting and its impact on the financial statements. So how do you feel about impact accounting or the process of turning negative externalities into tangible dollar amounts? Do you think impact accounting better reflects company value, or do you think impact accounting is problematic because how can one accurately attach a dollar amount to, say, a less diverse workplace? First of all, amazing question. <laughs> thank you for asking something like that. Um, and thank you for coming and sharing and devoting your, your collegiate years to studying something like this. Um, my two cents. I think, you know, we partnered with an organization called PCAP. I'm sure you're probably familiar with PCAP helping us to um, incorporate these kind of carbon factors into like our loan portfolio, our investment portfolio. All of that is done by people just like you that have a degree just like yours um, that are incorporating those factors. Something that for sure is a struggle in this space is how do you manage additionality um, when you're incorporating kind of these new factors into like financial models. I don't think there's a perfect solution yet. I think it varies industry by industry, which I'm sure you're discovering. Um, so I don't think there's a perfect solution, um, but I think industry by industry, there are uh, groups that are doing a really good job at managing it. And I think it's absolutely an addition. Um, and to your last part of how do you like to equate a dollar amount to certain like social or environmental factors, there's a lot of groups that are doing it on like a point system. Again, it's not dollar for dollar, but there's a lot of kind of point systems that are being equated that are models that help you analyze risk and outcomes that aren't necessarily tied to a financial outcome. I'll send you the report on that too. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions from the audience? 
they do it in economics, environmental economics. So the environmental side, they have a pretty good framework to monetize it. But she's right about that. How do you do a diverse workforce? Well, that's not quantifying the risk of not having that, right? <coughs> I have two questions. One question from me, one question is from the Zoom online audience. Um, my question is, uh, you just mentioned a lot about like the transparency, like how to communicate with investors about ESG initiative. Uh, actually, um, Professor Kevin Bazian and you have done a lot of research on this area. We find that uh, comparing with like, a lot of companies, they did a lot of uh, uh, KSG-related initiatives uh, because many cons investors and customers don't know about that. So that doesn't contribute to their like financial performance. Um, so in this case, do um, you have any recommendations like how the companies can better communicate with their investors or customers about their KSG initiative? I believe this new media play a very important role in here. We just mentioned social media, although there's a lot of controversy on, on the social media. But I think um, what is your recommendation for a good practice like how to use social media to communicate this ESG initiatives? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there's two ways that I see that this is done in, in a really successful way. I'll speak first to the public side. Um, a lot of the major rating agencies from an ESG perspective, Sustainalytics, MSCI, a lot of them are aggregating digital information about companies off their websites. Um, so the first thing a company can do from a public perspective is to disclose those factors that they have because essentially like a lot of these companies are using data aggregation online to say, okay, what does this university disclose about their diversity of their board. And if there isn't any information there, it's zero. And that's not good. So that's the first thing that can do is disclose those things online. Um, the second is, and we partnered with some of these organizations as well, there's a ton of groups that do this, is they do specific advocacy work when they see voids of data online. So um, Equally specifically is a gender um, data aggregation company that then gives scores uh, for individual companies. But let's say they approach a company and they don't see all of the metrics that they would want to fit into their framework, they'll engage with that company to say, hey, we're trying to create a report this year and we see that you are void of half of the data points that are in our report. Are these metrics that you're collecting within your company? Um, and if they aren't, why not? And if they are, you should make them public because that's really helpful for investors and consumers to get a better sense of who you are as an organization. Um, the good thing about public companies is that um, there's more skin in the game when it comes to engaging with them because they want to, again, social media being a huge factor is kind of maintain that consistent brand representation online, right? They want to kind of have this united um, front. On the private side, from an investor perspective, um, having a background in private equity and venture, I know that specifically when we're engaging with certain companies, that they have to meet a certain threshold of data disclosures around these factors. So we wouldn't look at a company unless they hit these like top um, 100 metrics or whatever it may be. But from a public perspective, like, thankfully there is more and more that's being um, done and even as an individual, like if you're, if there's a company that you're really interested in either working there um, or you buy products from them and there's data that you don't see that you would like to see about that company, you'd be surprised even as an individual that you can engage with large companies and, and reach out and say like, hey, I'm just wondering about gender equality or gender pay balance within your company. I haven't seen anything disclosed. Like, is there anywhere you can point me to where this information is? Um, and I think that's where social media comes in, where people like catch on to that and say, hmm, that's interesting. So and so doesn't talk about this, or they don't disclose that, or we can see that they donate tax, or, or whatever it may be, and that's kind of how like social then takes over. But yeah, there's a lot of like direct advocacy that even an individual can do to get that information. Well, first of all, what is your first name? Yeah. Oh, my name is Jean. What is it? Jean. J I N G. Jean. Jean. Yeah. Okay. Nice to meet you. Because uh, you all know who we are, so we're trying to know who's asking the questions. Uh, I'll say two things. One is what companies shouldn't do is try to be the young cool kid on social media. Right? That is not going to convey your information. I mean, then you're going to get blocked. Uh, so don't do that. I, I think um, I think part of this is also who your validators are. So you know, it's not just the company putting out the information and saying, "Oh, people should see this and know how well we're doing." It's also about who are your partners. You know, if you're based here in Boston. Or Massachusetts, and we were partnered with them by Latinx, or with the, you know, the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, um, or other you know organizations like that who have the trust and buy-in of the communities that you may be, or that these companies may be trying to reach. So I, I think 
you know, in addition to the companies putting the information out, it's also about like who who is your representative of the communities you're, you're seeking to um, to impact. And I think just to add to that, it can't be tokenistic. You know, we can't just talk about what we're doing during Black History Month. You know, we're always going to advocate for this to be integrated into every board meeting. Now, not just have a short section on the annual report, but is this in your quarterly reporting, your monthly reporting? You know, that's a, a way to kind of show that genuine investment and integration of ESG and to avoid any chance of you know, someone maybe realizing, I was going to say thinking, <laughs> maybe realizing the kind of tokenism behind it. Yeah. I think also social media is very uh, helpful to help us to reach out to a specific group of customers that have specific interest for um, different kind of KSG topics. Uh, so I think that makes it will be very helpful here. And one more question from the audience on, uh, from the Zoom. Um, so this, uh, this attendee asked, many U.S. companies compete internationally. If U.S. companies become too focused on ESG and not competing, do they risk losing market share from international competitors who are less focused on these issues? As we have seen, U.S. consumers are very willing to shop on price, even if products are made in countries with poor environmental and labor practices. So does ESG, does, does, does American companies committing to ESG put them at a disadvantage in the global marketplace? And, and do consumers, <coughs> excuse me, who, who are willing to, sh to, to shop on price, um, is that going to kind of submarine any efforts for ESG? If we lived in a world where companies were so oriented towards climate and the environment that they were losing market share, I would be shocked. Uh, that has yet to happen where someone was so environmentally conscious as a, as a large company that they started to lose like, market share. If anything, we can look to like the Patagonians of the world that have been like leaders in environmental sustainability, specifically around full supply chain manufacturing, um, that that's something that they've taken into account. Um, for me, they're like one of the leaders in the space from a from a consumer good pers perspective that you could look to to say, okay, like they're fully transparent around scope one, two, and three emissions, which is rare and hopefully will become the new norm. And they're also really transparent about their gaps in supply chain of kind of what parts they own and how environmentally conscious they are of those of those pieces and which parts they don't own and the parts that they're still working on. Um, my perspective on this is I think that brands that have shown a greater level of, again, transparency and that they're investing in those types of solutions have fared better and sustained more over time. Um, you know, you can think of some models, maybe like Tom's Shoes as a consumer good product that has definitely struggled in the past because that wasn't a sustainable model. And I think that maybe speaks a little bit more to like business economics than like overly incorporating sustainable factors. Um, that's probably something for like an economic major in this room to debate more than me. Um, but yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. I think it, it'd be an interesting problem to have where we're like, well, companies are going so far and above and beyond around sustainability and caring about governance and, and workers' rights that they're losing market share. I, you know, happy to be corrected if someone has a great example of that. But I, I don't, one doesn't come to mind. What about the second part of the question where not every American consumer, but a lot of American consumers yeah. Uh, are focused on price of the product, right? And that's their that's their order winner. Um, Nike not so much anymore, but there was a time when Nike had a questionable labor uh -huh. practice, but it didn't seem to stop their bottom line, right? And so I think that's what we're thinking about here. Um, when push comes to shove, and I've got my monthly budget um, as a as a family as a household, where does ESG come, right? Does it does it does it truly matter to me at that point, or am I just looking at the, the price tag? I think a good example of this is the concept of eating like healthy food like food that's made really well that's like organic clean and local without pesticides and you know additives cost more unfortunately it's because our system hasn't been set up in a way that makes that food more accessible uh, to everyone and it's the same thing with you know products that are made more sustainably or made within the u.s tend to be more expensive than those are not so i you know completely understand why someone is shopping for price rather than maybe like a long-term investment whereas like eating better food is a better investment in yourself long term whereas the instant gratification of getting something that you want even though maybe it's cheaper has a longer 
negative outcome on the environment or supply chain or your personal health than maybe you know investing in something that's a little bit more money. So, so is it a so is it a, I don't I hate to use the word class because that's, that's that sounds sure. archaic. But is it a, is it a social demographic split like like the upper income folks have a have the privilege to be able to shop that way, whereas lower income folks, ESG might as well be, you know. But I, think, but I think that, so embedded in the question are the are assumptions, mm -hmm. right? Are assumptions that low income communities, you know, even e even if they live, let's say, in food deserts, want to eat that way, right? They are still seeking, you know, they might seek a, a, a farm cooperative to get access to healthy fruits and vegetables that actually may be cheaper than what's in the supermarket, right? Um, their, their efforts, right, in urban areas, like urban farming initiatives. So I think that the, it, it's the whole, it depends, right? Like it's an answer. I think it, we're assuming that um, people it, with low incomes only shop on price and they don't care about anything else. Um, because if it's local, if it's in your community, you might be willing to pay a little bit more, right? You may not actually just be shopping on price. You might want to support the, you know, the, the friends and family business, right? That is employing, um, you know, your your <coughs> children, your, your friends, and you know, you by virtue of buying from them, even if it costs more, you're creating jobs and you're supporting jobs. So there, there's a lot that goes into that question that I think we have to take into account. Yeah, I think for me the, the idea that someone can have the intention to spend in a certain way but not have the choice is very sad. I think, I think that's what we're all basically here talking about. It's that inequality piece. And I think you know, localizing this, you know, to Greater Boston, there's amazing communities, restaurants, that we want those to thrive, you know. Um, and the way to do that is have the local population shopping locally. And I think you know, we're Try and work that out. How do you, you know, back to your point, have someone realise that actually this is for me, shopping sustainably, shopping healthy, this is for me. And I think what we've seen across the chamber is a real um, success with some businesses who manage to convince, you know, uh, residents that you can afford it. There's a perception, but that's not always the reality. I think you know, what we're always encouraging is for our bigger corporations to also make that step, to not reinforce you know, this idea that the bottom line but actually make products and, and promote them more sustainably. And that's where there's a huge opportunity for some of our businesses to thrive. Because they, they know that the community is so much better than the corporations. You know? um, and so we see that with advisors you know, on, on boards and within companies now from the communities, just to try and change that perception that, the Other questions? Hi, my name is Amy Pinal. I teach here at Emmanuel. Thank you for being here. Um, I teach accounting and I'm very passionate about financial literacy. Could you talk about how your work um, relates to financial literacy efforts? Well, I'll put a plug in here for the Office of Workforce Development, which has done incredible work in just even the last 20 years uh, around financial literacy, uh, led by Trent Nguyen. And, um, that particular office for financial literacy is led by Mimi Tershinitz. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the Boston Saves program, for instance, um, and, and other initiatives actually located on Palmer Street in Roxbury, or they, they uh, work with thousands of Bostonians every year to help folks um, not only understand, uh, but also put money in people's pockets uh, to either save, invest, et cetera. So, um, anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a really important piece um, on the Boston side. Yeah, and I would say from, from my standpoint, we, we talk a lot about financial literacy as a way to empower you know, lower income communities, people of color um, that, that uh, live in poverty, let's say. And it is insufficient to do financial education. It has to be coupled with asset building. Uh, and so that's where you know, we do it at Boston Impact, Impact Initiative from the business side, right? So we're supporting our, our entrepreneurs um, perhaps it's with financial education, with supporting them in their business model, their financial model, so that they can ultimately gain investment. Um, but in the end, they need assets, right? So part of what we're providing is the capital they need to keep growing their business and build their assets. From the individual perspective, I worked at a nonprofit before Boston Impact called Compass Working Capital, 
which provides financial education and coaching to families that live in subsidized housing. And that program is coupled with asset building by allowing, um, that there's a program that's uh, through HUD that allows people in subsidized housing to save through rent increases. And I don't know if you know this, if you live in subsidized housing, you are prevented from saving over $2,000. Uh, sorry, so you're prevented from having assets over $2,000. So imagine that, if you are trying to get out of poverty, how are you supposed to do that if your limit is $2,000? So there's a disincentive, right, to uh, earn more money because you will pay more rent, and therefore that rent goes to a landlord, right? That is probably not your best friend. So the, the goal is to take those rent payments and create an, an asset pool. So when you couple financial education um, with knowledge and social capital, and you have an asset, some people leave the program with $25,000 that they can then use to buy a home. That's real asset building. And you could do that through uh, sponsored accounts, employer-sponsored accounts, there's uh, ISAs, there's lots of ways to create assets. Um, but I, I think we talk a lot about like, oh, let's just teach poor people, right? How to be better budgeters, and how not to get into debt. Well, they're really good, they're really good at managing money, I would say. But it's the inability to access good financial safe products that's the issue and the inability to save. So I would I love financial literacy when it is coupled with the asset building problem. I have so many questions. There's, this is so wonderful to, to hear this. Everyone has this conversation, especially in the last in a couple of years of the pandemic and what needs to happen to really game change a lot of conversations in a certain direction. Uh, my question is the wealth disparity, 1% of the population, say the Boston, you know, the Boston community owns most of the money. And also on a global scale, again, there's a very small percentage of people that own most of the wealth. What needs to happen to, to tip that? Who is the game changer that we need to shift in Boston and who's the game changer we need to shift? country to be able to like, you know, this, if they shift, then if real change will happen uh, and on a faster scale than what, you know, uh, us as liberal are trying to do, it's going to take us so, so long to do that, um, so to be a tidal wave. What are the big wigs that we need to go shake down? The 1%? <laughs> yes. Yeah, all oh, now you're talking, you're talking like policy, wealth tax, I mean, it, it's a whole another ball game, right? It, 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 it's, it's hard because you, a lot of those are tax, it's wealth redistribution that has to happen, right? And the things that move the needle substantially um, are things like wealth taxes, like land ownership, like shifting, you know, divesting some of those assets. I mean, the, there, there's uh, individual, very wealthy folks that, like Mackenzie Scott, right, that's taking a huge portion of her assets and giving them out to philanthropy. So she's divesting her wealth. Um, could that happen at scale? I don't know. But that, that, that's a bigger conversation, though. Yeah, I'm and trying to avoid. I'm trying to avoid headlines. Um, <laughs> 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 to be honest, well, you know. Um, so exactly what Betty said, um, and you know, the the mayor has it. Definitely in the last, she's been in office 142 days now. Um, you know, a lot of the initiatives that have been introduced have been um, initiatives to uh, begin that transfer. Uh, in fact, literally the transfer fees uh, initiative that she's proposed. Um, but, you know, as Betty said, that ownership piece, you know, I, I shared with the mayor before coming on and, and others that I'm working with, like, before I leave this role, um, all the ownership piece is going to be a hallmark of my cabinet of making sure that Bostonians, particularly in communities of color, own where they live, breathe, work, and play. Uh, because that is the true wealth building. Um, and as much as we focus on it for housing, which, you know, Chief Dillon, uh, Sheila Dillon, who's been uh, Chief of Housing for a number of years, even in the previous administration, um, and has been a huge affordable housing advocate. Um, it's, you know, we, we are coupling on, in our cabinet on the commercial side as well, right? We want business owners to own their land, to own their property. Um, that's the true, that's the true piece of it. And that's real generational wealth, which is how wealth 
has accumulated to the one percent that a lot of folks got it from the person that came before them. Um, so you know, uh, government is a could, is one catalyst in that. It is also working with partners like that are on this panel and in the private sector to help make that happen and, and others. But um, certainly, this administration is focused on uh, making sure that. Uh, we are eliminating the wealth gap, not, not you know, reducing it um, uh, across the board. But yeah, it is, you know, what's been shown so far. So that's not a headline. So to John and Maybe I can say the headline part. Sure. Yes. Please. We won't get you quoted, but I think it's no surprise to anyone how we got here. I think if we're very honest, there's, you know, how many hundreds of years of uh, social discrimination within policies that kept the majority of people in the places that they are. It wasn't by any fault of their own, but the systems that they're forced to live within and function within. And I think the way we address that from a policy perspective, I think the way we look at historically as CEOs' salaries go up and the average salary of a, a worker, and let's say at a, at a manufacturing company, has stayed stagnant uh, for how many decades? I think that's a pretty obvious scale of one person going one way and one person going the other. And if you're looking at that person that happens to be going up, has had three or four generations of their you know, predecessors also going up, then the divide continues um, to grow. I know from a banking perspective, um, I can say that you know, some of the initiatives that we've had for decades is about small business loans, specifically to communities of color um, where existing credit didn't exist, um, free credit, uh, um, free checking accounts, um, that had no fee for those groups to be able to send money back to their uh, families or, or country of origin. So there's definitely different mechanisms that can be pulled. Um, I'm not an economist. I don't know that any of us are that we have like a one flip solution. I think if we did, someone you know incredibly smart would have probably already been able uh, to do that. But I think there's a lot of different tools across all of our particular areas of focus that hopefully will address that. Um, I guess to finish on a positive note, you know, it's exciting, the idea of opportunity being given and for us to have the chance to see what happens, you know, in terms of you know, new businesses, entrepreneurs, that that's what we're kind of pushing for. Um, but what needs to happen is, you know, the gates need to be opened for people to walk through. <coughs> okay, so in the interest of time, um, that'll be the last question, but we want to end with, um, our uh, sponsor from Alabama, my Alabama Bank, uh, Mark Walsh, uh, have him say a couple words uh, before we before we wrap up here. So, okay. Mark. Thank you so much. I, um, I just first want to start by thanking our panel, panelists for this terrific conversation today. We really appreciate your time, your insights in, your, in the work that you do every day to focus business investors in the public sector on environmental sustainability, social equity, and responsible and transparent governance. Uh, point of personal privilege as a voter, I'm thrilled to hear where you are, so again, um, you know, you won't confuse motion for progress, so we're looking forward to seeing what you are able to do. On behalf of Amalgamated Bank, I want to thank Emanuel College and the Emanuel Emanuel Business Collaborative for hosting us today, and specifically Kelly and John, you've been amazing to put this event together, so thank you so much for your hard work. And finally, I want to thank everybody who's here, both in person and online, and I, I know that I think, um, I hope that from some of you will go away today inspired to take a, have a career in ESG. I hope all of us will go away today committed that we are going to demand more from companies where you buy from, where you work from, and you invest. Kelly mentioned earlier that Amalgamated was founded a century ago by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America to support immigrant worker families. And we've grown to the largest B Corp uh, bank in the country. We're proud that we're the banking partners of thousands of nonprofits, political organizations, labor unions, and for-profit social enterprises that care about issues like ESG. When it comes to social responsibility, Amalgamated demands a lot of itself and a lot of the companies that we do business with. We believe that without a doubt, corporations and banks specifically can and should pay, be bold to play an active role in shaping public policy and advocating for the values we believe in. That means fighting climate change, paying fair wages, and addressing both, both externally and internally racial and gender inequity. That, that's why our bank does not invest in fossil fuels, gun manufacturers, pay, manu pay, pay to lenders, organizations that discriminate against women, promote hate, or impede workers' rights. That's why we endorsed HR 40, 
which would establish a federal commission to study reparations. That's why we endorsed the PRO Act, which would support the right of workers to organize. That's why we were a founding member of the Global Banking Alliance, um, which would establish a uh, sta financial standards that we can get to net zero in compliance with the, um, the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And that's why here in Massachusetts, we're part of the New England Offshore Wind Coalition and the first corporation to, to endorse the coalition to protect workers' rights. We really do believe that, that advocacy for social change is in our DNA, DNA and should be in every corporate DNA. So I think we have a good start here today, and I would say to all of you, we need to start together. I'm so glad we have such great partners here, and let's now work towards making social change by forcing our corporations in America to, to be the change we want to see. So thank you so much. Seniors consider amalgamated bank, right? Thank you very much. Sure.